as I, w- I was praying about where we are as a church and, and where God is taking us as a body, I, I felt like I wanted to take the next few weeks with you. Uh, I, have, I have planned four weeks. I, I'm not sure if that's what the Holy Spirit is going to stop me at, but and, and we're going to dive in to the first chapter of the book of James. Everybody say James. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with the book of James, let me just kind of set the stage for you, okay? James is written by James. It's not a tough question, okay? Most of the Bible, most of the books in the Bible are named after the person who wrote them, and so the book of James is like that. It's in the New Testament. It's not a real long book. It's just five chapters. You can read it, sit down, read it in a few moments. But James is considered to be one of the most practical books in your New Testament. He doesn't deal with a lot of theology. He deals with a lot of how to live out a victorious Christian life. And it's a very practical. The person named James who wrote the book, theologians and scholars and historians tell us that he was actually the biological brother of Jesus. And he was also the first head of the Christian church in the city of Jerusalem. The book of James is also considered to be one of the oldest books in the New Testament. It was actually written before the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was written within less than 50 years after the life of Jesus on earth. And it was written during a period of time when the early believers were very much persecuted, life was tough. Anybody had tough life sometimes? And so this really applies to anybody who has struggles in your life. So if you have your phones, tablets, or Bibles, we're going to begin in James chapter 1, verse 1. It's a good place to start. Here's the way it opens. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Verse 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything one translation says let perseverance finish its work so that you may be perfect and complete how many of you would like to be perfect how many would like for your spouse to get perfect don't thank you Cindy raised her hand right away I I noticed that okay (laughs) today my title is processing our problems now for those of you in the room who don't have any problems and never have had a problem and you know you're not ever gonna have a problem you can just take a vacation this morning but for those of us who live in the real world and have to put up with the dans of the world (laughs) we're gonna learn how to process our problems how to process putting up now maybe you don't have a problem but maybe you're sitting by somebody who has problems so for that reason you may want to take notes this morning I've got two big thoughts we're gonna talk about and then we're gonna make some applications here we go big thought number one on your outlines this morning life will have problems I know you're all surprised I really did not feel like there was going to be an overwhelming amen on that. But if you could at least say yes, right? Life will have problems. Now, if you have never had a problem in your life, you just haven't lived long enough. Because life has problems. In fact, it's interesting in our text today, James writes, and look what he says in verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Notice he says, whenever you face trials he doesn't say if you face trials he starts it out in verse 1 by saying this letter is addressed to the 12 those who are scattered among the nations 
The people who were first reading this letter that James wrote were people who had been persecuted, ran out of their homes, had family members who were imprisoned and even put to death. They were living in a tough time. And that's who he wrote to. Now, if you were to write a letter, if I was to write a letter to people who were having a lot of problems, I'm not sure I would have started by saying, hey, be happy. It's kind of like, are you on some drug? Consider it pure joy, really? You, you, you got to look at it again. For, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials. Is he just some kind of a feel-good guru? When the doctor gives me the bad report about my health, am I supposed to go, oh, thank you? When the boss calls you in tomorrow morning and says, your services are no longer needed, here's your severance check, clean out your desk. Oh, I'm so happy. Or when your spouse says, we need to talk. All the married folks know what I'm talking about. Amen. Or how about when your child or your grandchild makes a decision that you know is not going to end well? Not a good direction. And you just go, oh, pure joy. What's the deal? Now, you have to understand something, that when James wrote this letter, up till that time, the religious leaders in Judaism taught that bad things happen to only bad people. And good things happen to only good people. And then this rabbi named Jesus comes along and has a different teaching. And in John chapter 16, Jesus said... I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Everybody say it. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have what? Overcome the world. But you understand, Jesus said, hey, if you're going to follow me, life is going to suck sometimes. That's the Darius translation. But it works. Life is going to have problems, and, and I think we're better off once we just accept that fact. I used to think when I, when I was young, growing up in church, I used to think that if I ever really got saved enough, I would never have another problem. Right? Evangelists loved me because every evangelist we had at church, they had at least one convert that was going to come to the altar. Because there was something I needed to repent of, putting bubble gum underneath the chair at church. Not, you know, not doing my chores. I said, told mom I did do when I didn't do. Yeah, I was just, I was convinced I would, I would never have another problem if I just loved God, loved people, and did what was right. And guess what? Problems still came. Because life will have problems. And I know you don't want to, but you, you ought to say amen. Now, so if life has problems, then how do we respond to the problems in our life? Well, people who are much smarter than me have studied human behavior, and they tell me that there are about four stages that most of us go through. It's very unique because each one of us stay in each stage at different times, and sometimes we even process them differently, but these are pretty common stages. So if you want to jot them down, maybe as, as you look at them this morning, you may want to just kind of ask yourself, if you're in problems, which one of these stages am I in? Stage number one is what I call the churn stage. Everybody say churn. Churn. Now, if you're like me, when I was typing that all week long in my notes, I kept putting church stage. It's not the church stage. It's the churn stage. Churn stage is this. The churn stage is the stage where we're asking questions, hard questions like, why? Where are you, God? You find those a lot of times in the book of Psalms 
when David writes in the conflicts of his life, David writes some beautiful psalms asking God, God, why do the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer? Where are you, O oh God? Have you abandoned us? Or questions like this, what did I do so wrong? Where did I mess up? Those questions that sometimes wake us up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, those questions that keep us from being able to go to sleep at night, that's the churning stage. It just keeps on rolling over and over and over and over with no answers. During the churning stage, most of us want to just escape. Pull up the covers, turn out the lights, and escape from people and problems. That's the churning stage. Stage number two is what I call the burn stage. Everybody say burn. This is where we move from just asking questions to actually getting angry. We get angry at God sometimes. We get angry at people. We're good at that, aren't we? And we can even get angry at ourselves. How y'all doing? And that anger leads us frequently to bitterness, to resentment, and to a desire for revenge. And we create our own narrative out of facts and assumptions as to why we are justified in being angry. And in the burn stage, it just burns on the inside. And our desire is no longer to escape, but our desire is now to correct everybody. When you're in that burning stage, you want to go tell everybody off. In fact, if you, if you read social media, there are people who live in the burning stage. They need deliverance. Okay, I just, that's not a good place to do it. Burning stage churning stage. Here's the third stage. The third stage is what I call the yearn stage. Everybody say yearn. The yearning stage is you have passed the burning, you have passed the, the uh, churning, thank you. You have passed the churning and the burning and now you go to the yearning stage and in the yearning stage that's where you just dream about how it was so wonderful before. If we're not careful, we can get really trapped here. Churches are notorious for being trapped in stage three. We talk about the good old days. Here's the problem with most of our memories of the good old days. Number one, they weren't near as good as you thought they were. <laughs> Hello? People talk about those good old days of 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 years ago. You didn't love them that much back then. You know, everybody talks about wanting to go back. Hey, I am really glad for air conditioning. I don't want to go back to those brush arbor days. Or Some of you are too young to remember the days when we didn't have air conditioning or padded seats and we had those wooden pews that a sister so-and-so moved just right, you got pinched on the other end. Yeah, we talk about how wonderful those days were. Man, we didn't even have a piano that was in tune. See, our, our memories, God gives our memories this great ability to gloss over a lot of times the bad stuff. And we just pull out the good. And we want to go back to those old days. But you know what? The truth of the matter is you can't ever go back. God's mercies are new. Everybody say new. New, new every morning. God's not interested in taking me back. God's interested in taking me forward. You see, I've been in this thing now 68 years. I was born almost in church. And I, would, I, I, I have seen almost everything there is to see that's going on. I've seen the weird stuff. I've seen the real stuff. I've seen a lot of stuff in between where you didn't know which one it was in. And you know what? I'm still convinced there's some things that God has for me that I haven't yet experienced. 
because I'm not going to live long enough to experience everything God's got. Hello? Be careful of the yearning stage. Don't get trapped always wanting to go back. The first group, they want to escape. The second group, they want to set everybody right. The third group just wants to go back and make it all like it was. And so that brings me to the fourth stage, and this is where I'm, I'm hoping us to get to today. And this is what I call the learn stage. Everybody say learn. This is when, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we begin to ask God, how can I grow through this problem? You see, if I believe that God is really God, then there's nothing that's going to happen in my life that's going to surprise God. Think about that a moment. No sickness is going to surprise God. God's not, God doesn't wake up tomorrow morning and go, oh, I had no idea he was getting fired today. <laughs> we get surprised. He doesn't. If, God, if I have yielded my life to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then whatever happens to me today or tomorrow or next week, God already knows about it. And guess what the Bible tells me about God? He is working all things together for my good. It doesn't say that God's working the good things together for my good. Are the bad things together for my good he's working all things together for my good how y'all doing out there this is easy stuff so if God's working all things together for my good then my question should be whatever problem whatever diagnosis whatever addiction whatever circumstance I'm in I say okay God what what can I learn from this how am I gonna grow I don't want to be like the children of Israel who have to keep going in circles for 40 years until I learn the lesson. Oh, that was good. Oh, yeah, I better move along. I'm going to run out of time. So my first key thought was this. Life will have problems. Let's go to key thought number two. Big thought today. Winners have the right perspective. Everybody say perspective. Oh, let me tell you, this is going to be really good. You're going to, I, I'm expecting some amens during this part, okay? This is the good part. If, if I'm going to learn, if I'm going to get to that stage of learning, then my learning is going to start with perspective. Years ago, a very smart man told me something that it took me a while to understand, and when I did, it has really helped me in life. It is this. Nobody lives with the facts of life. We all live with our interpretation of the facts. Okay, let me explain it to you. I'll, I'll make a real simple illustration here. My friend Gilbert sitting on the front row. If I come off the platform, walk over there and slap him upside the face. That is a fact. Now, there's a lot of different interpretations. His mom sitting there beside him says, well, God finally answered my prayers. Somebody's <laughs> correcting him. See, that's her interpretation of the fact. She's going to be my new best friend. She's going to jump up and give me a hug. Oh, thank you, Pastor. He needed that. Or she could interpret it and go, what, that mean old pastor? Why is he picking on my boy? My boy's a good boy. Fact doesn't change, but her reaction changes. In fact, the relationship between me and his mom changes by the way she interprets it, not by the act. Even more so, what's really important is how does he interpret it? Because he's a pretty big boy. And I got a hunch I could be in trouble. So you know what I know about Gilbert? Gilbert's going to interpret my slap based upon his previous encounters with me. Not only just his previous encounters with me, he's going to, it's going to translate through his filter. I, I say it this way, we all carry our bags with us in life. 
all of the good, bad, ugly, everything that happens to us in life, those are our bags. And whatever we encounter today has to go through those bags and be translated and interpreted. And that becomes our perspective. That's why he may have gotten an argument on his way in church this morning. He may have had a lousy day. He was running late and, the, and got stopped and got a ticket coming to church. What a lousy way to start a Sunday morning, right? And he walks in here and sits down. I don't even have to slap him. I just look at him and all of a sudden he gets mad. Well, that pastor. You see, it's because his perspective is messed up because of the filter that he's translating it all through. That's where we all need the Holy Spirit to come sometimes and clean out our filter because we're carrying garbage of the past and letting the garbage of the past color everything that's happening today. Ooh, we could have an altar call right there. Yeah. That's why you meet one person who's been through the exact same problem that another person has had, and this person's full of joy, and this person's mad at everybody. The same facts. See, I used to think that all these wonderful senior saints who were so beautiful and godly and smiled and joyful must have had an easy life. And you know what I discovered? Some of them had the hardest life out there, but they just decided they were going to live with the right perspective and not allow the enemy to steal their joy. Ooh. Winners aren't the people who had the least amount of problems. They just learned from their problems. Hello. And they had the right perspective on their problems so if you're taking notes let me give you three perspectives that that I believe winners have here's number one winners decide that no problem can defeat me unless I let it let's say it out loud together would you join me no problem can defeat me unless I let it unless I let it you know what the Bible says about you and me the Bible says that because we are spirit-filled believers and followers of Jesus Christ, we are a winner. The Bible says the greater one lives inside of us and has declared, God has declared, you are an overcomer. Now, whether you feel like one or not doesn't matter. God says you are. You say, well, where does he say that? 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, you, dear children, are from God and have what overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world you realize what it says there you have overcome them you go down one more chapter first John chapter 5 everyone born of God does what everyone born of God overcomes the world everyone born of God overcomes the world it doesn't say every preacher overcomes the world or every evangelist overcomes the world or every missionary overcomes the world it doesn't say every person who's perfect overcomes the world it just says every person who's born of God what do I have to do to be born of God if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that he raised him from the dead I shall be saved I am born of God Hello, if you're not born of God, you can be born of God this morning before you leave this room. And the moment you're born of God, he says you are an overcomer. You need to start looking in the mirror and say, good morning, overcomer. Ooh. Why do I need to do that? Because I need to change the perspective of how I look at myself. Because I will never live above the perspective that I have of myself. James is writing to these believers, and James says, count it all joy when you encounter various problems. Not because you're happy about the problem, you're happy about what is going to come out of your problem, and that is your perfection. Wow. No person, no problem, no addiction, no lack, no abuse, no satanic power on earth can defeat me because I am born of God. Winners have the 
mindset that no problem can defeat me unless I let it. Here's my second perspective. Every problem is an opportunity. Every problem is an opportunity. Everybody say opportunity. Opportunity. If every problem is an opportunity, then I need to find the opportunity. That's the learning stage we talked about a moment ago. Go back to our text, first, or James chapter 1, verse, let's start in verse 3. James says, because you, the reason you can count it pure joy is because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Boy, y'all y'all didn't say that very good. In fact, most people consider that to be a four-letter word. There is a four-letter word for perseverance. It's called W-A-I-T. Y'all, y'all, you got the, good, thank you. You're kind of going like, W-A-I, who is that, okay. Thank you, Gilbert. I appreciate you helping. They were all still trying to fix it in their head. They were thinking really hard. I, I don't like to wait. In fact, I, we were in, in our 845 men's prayer time this morning. There was one brother in the group who asked that the rest of us would pray that God would help him with perseverance. And I was like, oh, don't, 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 don't ask that. <laughs> Every time I've asked God to, to, to help me with perseverance, I wind up in the longest line every place I go. Light turns red every time I get there. You know, I, it's like the guy who said, God, I want, I, I want perseverance and I want it now. <laughs> Not going to happen. Perseverance only grows through problems. Oh. But that's what he says here. He says, the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Here, here's the little formula. I wrote this on my notes. You don't get to perfection without problems and perseverance. It's a real simple formula. Some of you have already got the first step. You got problems. You're a third of the way there. Take your problems and add perseverance. Now you're almost home. How y'all doing? This is good. In every problem, there's opportunities. Find it. One of my favorite stories uh, is the Astrodome in Houston, Texas. Became the most historic landmark in the city of Houston. Back in the 1960s, there was a group of businessmen, a very wealthy group of guys got together, and they decided they would do something that nobody had ever done. They would build an indoor stadium in which they could play football and baseball. There were many people who told them they were foolish, it couldn't be done, but they figured out how to do it. They, they got some very intelligent engineers and scientists to figure out for them how they could build this stadium that could seat 66,000 people, unheard of at the time, and that they would have a field on which they could play football or baseball depending on the time of the year. As they got near the end of the project, they ran into a major problem. We're talking a major problem because they discovered that the scientists were wrong. The grass that they had planted on the field was dying. And in spite of the translucent covering of the, state of the, are of the arena and stadium, the grass would not grow. They had already sunk millions of dollars into the project, and all they had was a big field of dirt. As soon as the word got out, many of the investors began to withdraw their support. But there was a handful of guys who were so deeply invested, they had no way out. They had to figure out some way to make it work. And so one of them came up with the idea of contacting some carpet companies the manufacturers of carpet, and they called together the five leading manufacturers of carpets in the United States of America. And one of those five decided to take on the challenge to see if it was possible to develop a man-made product that you could play sports on. Now, you and I are sitting here with 64 years, 
And we think, well, what's the big deal? We know what to do. But back then, nobody had ever heard of playing sports on anything other than real grass. And Monsanto carpet manufacturers came up with a product that they called AstroTurf. And there was great debate in the sports world as to whether the athletes would want to play on imitation man-made product. But now here we sit, 60 years later, and almost every stadium around the world, indoor or outdoor, plays on some version of AstroTurf. Artificial turf. How did we get AstroTurf? A problem. Somebody had to solve. Let me ask you a question today. In the problem that you're facing today, whatever it is, where's your AstroTurf? What's the possibility that hasn't even been thought of yet? Our God is Elohim. He is the great creator God. He is the God who said, let there be light. And suddenly out of nothing, there was light. Do you really think your problem is so big that God couldn't speak a word and give you a solution? Oh, that went over good. No problem can defeat me unless I let it. Here's number two. In every problem, there is opportunity. And here's number three. All problems are temporary. We are eternal. Paul, in reflecting on his life in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he wrote about the struggles of his life. Beginning in verse 16, he said, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles. You get that? You understand what Paul had been through. Twice he had been shipwrecked, thought lost at sea. Multiple times he had been imprisoned. He had been whipped. He had been beaten. On one occasion, he was left for dead. And yet he writes, our light and momentary afflictions. Come on. He says, they are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And look at verse 16 or 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Years ago, I, I, I love history. I love reading part of history because you can learn from history. I mean, why, you're not going to live enough to make all the mistakes yourself, so you might as well learn from somebody else's mistakes. It's a lot easier. And I was intrigued by John Rockefeller. During his day, John Rockefeller was considered one of the wealthiest men in the United States of America. The head of Standard Oil Company, he, he, he had inherited it. It was, it was amazing. His, his life had a lot of amazing stories. But one of the stories that was rather intriguing was that he was a history buff himself. And he was very concerned that the record of history showed that frequently when one generation would work hard and would amass a level of success and wealth, the second and third generation would often squander it, and by the fourth generation they would be broke again. And he began to figure out what would it take so that my sons and my grandsons and my great-grandsons could carry the family even further than what I have started it at. And, and that's what every one of us want, isn't it? We want our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren to go beyond anything we ever did. And yet it's still today, 100 years later, it's still a pretty big truth that 
often the second or third generation squanders what one generation built. And so he came up with this very, very interesting strategy. Number one, he made certain that his children were educated in some very good, not only intellectual education, but biblical education so that they had good moral foundation of their life. But when his son became a man and had completed his formal education, he sent his son to the oil fields to work as a manual laborer. Now, in those days, you have to understand, the oil fields was a place you did not go to work unless you had to. You worked six days a week, 12 hours a day. You lived in a bunkhouse where over a dozen men would live in each house. The work was hard. It was hot in the summer, cold in the winter. The life was tough. There were frequent fights. Everybody was mad because life was tough. If you were there, you were literally selling yourself to the company. You got paid in cash on Saturday night. Most of the guys were so cynical and upset with life that they hit the local bars and joints on Saturday night and Sunday. And by the time Monday morning rolled around, they were just as broke as they were the week before with no money left. A reporter became aware of what was going on and he found one of Rockefeller's sons who had been living in one of those oil camps, oil field camps, and interviewed him. And he was interested to realize that he was not angry, he was not upset, and he was actually saving money living in the bunkhouse. And he said, how is your attitude so good living in such a horrible place? I love this answer, Pastor Miriam. He said to the reporter, every day I remind myself, my dad owns the company. When dad decides it's time, he'll send a driver to pick me up and take me to my rightful home. Because this bunkhouse is not my home. My home is in New York City. How do we live with the day-to-day -day problems and disappointments? We remind ourselves, this isn't what God created me for. I'm created for heaven. The church that I grew up in, there was an elder statesman by the name of A.C. Bates. He was one of the early Pentecost pioneers. Last time I think I saw him, he was in his 90s, about six foot four and maybe 120 pounds lanky and tall when he would come to visit the church they would always invite brother Bates to greet the congregation he would share a word and almost without exception I think every time I heard him he would finish by going into an old song I was talking to the staff this morning early in prayer none of our staff has ever even heard it I thought Jeremy might lead it for us but it was way beyond his time A.C. Bates, that long, lanky physique, would stand on our platform and would sing, This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Angels beckon me to heaven's golden shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I'm a little concerned that we seem to have gotten so comfortable down here that we don't sing near as much about heaven these days as we used to.
talking with the staff this morning, I, we didn't hardly let a Sunday service go by that we didn't sing, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand, and leads me through that promised land. Oh, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Mom and Dad, let's don't forget to teach our children and our grandchildren, you weren't built for this earth. You're built for eternity. Every problem I have is temporary. I am eternal because I am made in the image of God. And God has said, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. No weapon formed against me shall ever prosper. Every tongue that speaks against me shall be silenced because I am a child of God. And I get to spend eternity in heaven. So whatever I'm going through today or tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, it's okay. Because I'm going home. And when he says it's time, Gabriel's going to blow the horn. And we're getting out of here. So Satan, you lose. The back of the book's already been written. We're going to celebrate in heaven. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, would you just take a moment and whisper a prayer and say, God, what are you saying to me? What's God trying to say to you today? Holy Spirit, would you speak to us this morning? Holy Spirit, would you breathe into this body? For those watching us online right now, Holy Spirit, would you just speak to them? For that man or woman or young man or young lady today that's struggling, their problems seem overwhelming. Lord, would you show them that the problem is a pathway to their perfection? And Lord, I pray specifically right now for those who are not yet followers of Christ. I pray for those today who may have come into this service and they're not sure that heaven's their home. And Lord, I pray that in these closing moments today, they would simply open up their heart. And invite Jesus to be their Lord and their Savior. With your head bowed, eyes closed, let's make a personal, private moment. If you're here to me and you'd be honest enough to say, Pastor Darius, I, I'm not sure that I'm qualified for heaven. I, I want to tell you this morning something that's very important, and that is this. It doesn't matter who you are, where you been or what you've done there's a God who loves you so much that he gave his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross of Calvary and Jesus came 2,000 years ago to this earth and he hung on a cross and gave his life to pay the price for your sins and my sins and the entrance for me and you into the family of God and into an eternal home in heaven has already been paid but you and I have the privilege to just simply accept God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. You can know right now that you are a child of God. You are forgiven and you can be free from the control and the consequences of sin. 
So if you're here today and you say, Pastor Darius, today I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. Today's my day. If that's you right now, would you just lift up a hand and say, here, Pastor, include me in this prayer. Today's my day. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm just looking around a moment. Say, Pastor, today's my day. Today's my day. Thank you so much. Would you stand with me all over the room? We're going to pray a prayer together. Would you just join me in this prayer? Lord God, I come in Jesus' name. I confess I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. Today, I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died and He rose again to pay the price for my sin. Jesus, I ask you to forgive me, to cleanse me. Holy Spirit, I ask you to take charge of my life. I yield to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, I pray for my friends who just spoke those words. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would break every chain, every habit, every hang-up, every hurt of the past. And that today they would begin a new journey with you. For I speak that in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed said, Amen. let's give the Lord a hand right now for that. Would you with me? Okay? We're just going to do it real simple.